Our text this morning is Luke 1, 26 to 34. Luke 1, 26 to 34. And while you guys are turning, I want to take a second to honor my man. My Ololufe, the head of my household. It's, it's one thing to be loved by a man, but it's another thing to be loved by a good man. And it's a whole nother thing to be loved by a godly man. I'm a lot, um, all the time. <laughs> but babe, you love me so effortlessly. So Damon Pope, my favorite Pope, thank you so much. You guys have Luke 1? In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. Let's pray. God, we know you're in the place. We ask that you open up our ears and open up our hearts to receive exactly what it is you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you sit down, high five your neighbor and say, let go, let God. As Pastor Stephen said, we are in a series called Running with the Giant. And the whole premise is if we had giants of the faith come down and talk to us, what would they say? This morning, as you can tell by the text, we're talking about Mary. What's that saying behind every great man is a greater woman? That's my version. <laughs> but we're talking about Mary, who literally is the woman behind the greatest man that ever walked the planet. And I know y'all are probably like, what is she doing in Luke? It's July, Christmas ain't till December. Listen, I think Mary gets the short end of the six sometimes in church. We bring her up at Christmas and give her credit for, you know, having God in a manger, and then we just kind of leave her there. But how many of you guys know Mary has a little bit more to her? And if Mary was here with us in this moment, I think what she would tell us is give God complete control of your life. Give God complete control of your life. Are there any control freaks in here? Ooh, y'all proud. <laughs> I like that. I am one too. One more time for the control freaks. I, um, I am a control freak. It is something that I have been working on and I like to be in control at all times. I like to know what's happening, when it's happening, how it's gonna happen, who it's happening with. Um, I don't really care for surprises, but if it's for my husband, I still expect a surprise. Um, but I'm also the kind of person who will try to figure out what that surprise is. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, I have a six month old. His name is Christian Lee, and he is the cutest little thing ever. Um, he's probably the cutest baby that ever walked the planet. Yeah, I said it. Um, <laughs> but I remember when I first got pregnant, I was probably about two months, and I was um, coming home from work, and I was tired, and I was hungry. Now, I'm normally naturally always hungry, like I can always eat, but this was like coupled with hormones and, you know, just things are just, you know, they just, um, and I remember my husband, he was still in that, um, oh my gosh, we're having a baby phase. So he was still loving on me. That, the grace ran out around eight months. But we were still in the earlier phase, and he was still doting on me, hands and knees. And he's just like, you know, babe, what do you want to eat? And I'm like, I don't know. He's like, okay, okay, okay. You want Chick-fil-A? And I was like, no. He's like, you want Chipotle? I was like, no. He was like, you want Thai food? I was like, no. African food? No. China. I mean, he's running down every single country that offers food. <laughs> and I didn't know what I want. So he went in the bedroom to get changed and head out on this dummy mission to figure out what his wife was going to eat. And while he was in there, 
I um, went in the kitchen and I made myself a PB&J sandwich. Now, I don't normally eat PB&J, but I was hungry and it was just what I got. And I came on the couch and I'm eating and crying. Like, <laughs> I'm not emotional. For those of you who don't know me personally, I've probably cried about five times in my life and four of those I was probably getting a whooping. But I'm just not somebody who cries, but I'm sitting on the couch eating the sandwich and I mean, tears just streaming down my face. And my husband, Damon, he comes out and he's like panic stricken, like I was gone for two minutes. What happened? Why are you crying? And I'm sitting there like, I don't know. I just can't stop it. And it's just still eating my PB&J because I'm hungry. <laughs> and he's looking at me like, what's wrong? And it's so funny because like I'm sitting there, but I'm also thinking to myself like, Timmy, get it together. Like, this is not cute. But I had no control over my body. My hormones were raging and I just, I didn't know who I was and I had absolutely no control. I still don't have control because now he's here and I'm not getting no sleep and he just, he runs my life. But maybe you're in here and you're not a control freak. Maybe you're in here and you're independent. Growing up, you've had to rely on yourself. People have failed you, so now your little mantra is, you know, all you need in this life is sin. Forget a girlfriend. It's just me, myself, and I. Or maybe you're not independent. Maybe you're a problem solver. Maybe a problem happens and you automatically get into fix-it mode. Dare I say you fix it before you pray about it. The title of the message today is Jesus Take the Wheel. Jesus Take the Wheel. And I know it's a cliche, but see, we know all of these cliches, but do we believe them? Um, so I'm going to confess some things to you guys. We're going to get to know each other very well. Um, told you I'm a recovering control freak. Part of that is um, I don't like to be driven, um, point blank period. I don't like to be a passenger in somebody else's car. Um, the only person who could probably drive me, and I won't say anything, is my husband. And that's only because I have learned over the years to have a happy home and marriage. I need to shut up. But everybody else can get it. So if I'm in the car with you, I am that passenger driver. I'm telling you to turn left. I'm like, that light is yellow. You could have gone. I'm slamming on brakes. I'm pressing gas. I'm gripping consoles. But how many of you guys know that no matter what I do in that passenger seat, I have no control over that car. I can scream and holler and yell out my suggestions, but the driver gonna do what the driver wants to do. That's why I don't get in the car with y'all. <laughs> but see, a lot of times we do that with God. See, we think, God, I'm surrendering my life and I'm giving you control, but what we're really doing is we're in the driver's seat and we've put God in the passenger seat. And we take his suggestions when we want to, when they sound good, when we feel like, oh, that's a good idea, I'm going to try that. But if he says something that we don't really like, we, we just keep driving. See, a lot of times we're scared to surrender control and give God our lives because we don't want to miss out on the fun. Don't look at me like that, y'all know. <laughs> you think if you give God control of your life, he's going to have you in church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for Bible study. Or maybe you think he's going to send you on a missions trip to, like, Haiti or Nigeria. It's okay. We can. <laughs> I don't want no one coming up after me talking about what well, Haiti is. Just, you know, it's a great place. It is a great place. Or maybe you're worried about what other people will think. You're scared. Scared of your own limitations. Scared of your own abilities. See, Mary in our passage, Mary had plans. Mary was getting married. She found the man of her dreams. He was a carpenter, an entrepreneur. <laughs> they had plans. And an angel appeared, and I, I love the Bible. It says she was disturbed. I would be too. <laughs> I'm minding my business, and you're gonna talk about greetings, favored woman, hold up. <laughs> I have this thing where I don't like people being behind me. It's just, it's even in like in the office, I got to sit behind a wall. But, you know, I could just imagine she's sitting there and the angel appears like, wait a minute. But the angel was like, you're going to have a baby. Mary's just probably looking at him like, I'm a virgin. I know no man. How? 
But she didn't respond the way that I probably would have responded. She didn't respond the way that you guys probably would have responded. And I think it's because Mary understood that if you give God complete control over your life, you live a life far better than anything you could have imagined. So what I want to do today is I kind of want to give you guys three reasons why to give God complete control of your life. The first thing is this, it's not up to you. It's not up to you. I'm going to be honest with you guys. God's plans often seem impossible. Like, let's just run through them, right? We got David and Goliath. David, Goliath. We have Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. How? He had no army. We had Abraham and Sarah giving birth at 90 years old. Impossible. I remember um, about five years ago, I I was in my last year of law school, my last semester, and um, it was around March, and I had plans. My plan was to come up here, get my degree, and go back home. Home is Texas. That is where I'm from, the greatest state. Thank you very much. Dallas, Texas to be exact, I don't fool with Houston. (laughs) But I had plans to go back home. And I mean, y'all, my plans were good. I had interviews lined up. I had friends to catch up with. I had restaurants that I was craving and I had been missing. One of my favorite restaurants is this restaurant called Cheddar's. Don't just, y'all know! Eight o'clock, though, they be missing out. Cheddar, y'all, is, oh, it's not prime rib, it's not Ruth's Chris, it's nothing bougie, it's good, cheap food. And Cheddar's has this, um, they have this little appetizer, and it's three croissants for $1.25. It may have gone up to like $1.50, but it's still cheap. But it's three croissants, and they are like fresh out of the oven, 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 soft and gooey, and then they melt this honey butter glaze on it. And when you pull it apart, like, it's, yeah, I'm so hungry. (laughs) I told y'all I can always eat. But I had plans. And I remember I was driving um, in downtown Baltimore. And, no, y'all can't, y'all can't drive. (laughs) But I was driving, I was driving somewhere. And I was talking to my best friend about my plans. And she's in Texas, and I'm like, yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do that. And I got off the phone with her, and I was listening to worship music. And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, um, tell me, I want you to stay in Maryland. I want you to take a clerkship. And I promise y'all I'm saved now, but five years ago, God was still working on me. But I was just like, huh? You want me to do what? And like, (laughs) you're ever driving, and you think you hear something, you turn down the music? (laughs) Like someone's in the car? (laughs) And I'm like turning down the music, like, one, one more time, God, I didn't I ain't catch it. You want me to go to Houston, Texas? And he's just like, no, I want you to stay in Maryland. I want you to take a clerkship. And I was like, mm, okay. In my head, I'm like, I'm going to go home. We're going to pray this out. I mean, God going to work it out. It's going to be good. But I go home, and I pray, and I'm talking to God, and I'm like wrestling with him because I had plans, y'all. I wanted to go back to Texas. And um, finally, I was like, all right, God, let's, let, let's do it. But I was saying that because I did not think that I was going to get a clerkship. So let me explain what a clerkship is. A clerkship is like an apprenticeship that you do after law school. It's for a year. Um, It's like a little, like, you put a little respect on your JD. It just gives you a little bit more, like, your degree just gives it a little bit more oomph. And clerkships are highly, highly, highly competitive because essentially what you're doing is you're working for a judge. And judges are limited. So, mind you, I'm in March, and God is like, I want you to get a clerkship. My friends and most law students start applying for clerkships around July, August, September, and they're interviewing around October and November. They're getting offers in December and January. By March, ain't no clerkship. You're not going to find a clerkship. So I was just like, okay, God, whatever. (laughs) So the next weekend, I'm in church minding my business, and I think I had just fully begun to wrap my mind around, God wants me to stay, let me start working on this clerkship. And one of my friends comes up, and she's like, hey, my mom wants to meet you. 
Um, I'm African. And when I hear that a parent wants to meet me or, you know, you hear your parent wants to meet you, I'm thinking in my head, like, let me explain to you. When my mom wants to meet my friends, it's to commend them on something that they're doing, you know? It's just like if my mom ever meets you, her first thing is, what's your name? What do you do? You know, and it's just like, it's just one of those things where she's, you, you think that she's just going to be like, oh, you know, good, my daughter, you're doing good. You know, God is with you. He'll be there for you. Just keep following him. You know, that kind of thing. So I'm thinking she just wants to, like, give me my props. Uh, I was feeling myself a little bit back then, if y'all can't tell. So I was like, okay, I go meet her, and that's not what she wanted at all. But she was like, you know, hey, I heard you're in law school. You're about to graduate. And I was like, yeah, I am. And she was just like, do you know what you're going to do afterwards? And I was like, actually, um, yeah, I'm going to look for a clerkship. And she was like, okay, do you know what area you're interested in? And at the time, it was like family law and immigration. And I was like, yeah, family law, immigration. But honestly, I'll take whatever clerkship I can get. And she was like, okay, send me your resume. I may know someone. I said, okay. The next day, I'm getting my resume together, and I text my friend, and I'm like, hey, um, you know, give me your mom's information. So she gives it to me, and something told me, Google this lady before you send her anything. So I Google her. Um, guys, she didn't know someone. She was someone. And not only was she someone, she was the judge in charge of the family law division of Baltimore City Circuit Court. And not only was she the judge in charge, but she was also a believer. And she hadn't hired her clerk because she was waiting for God to send her her next clerk. Impossible. And here's a little side note. A lot of times we come to church and we leave. We don't serve on a dream team. We don't join a connect group. We don't get connected. And I'm, I'm, I was there. I was that person. I was busy and I came in and get out. But God, you don't know who's sitting in the room. You don't know who God has here to bless you. If you're a part of this church, jump in and get connected. It was because I knew someone that God was able to bless me. But that's not what this message is about. So, like I said, I got this clerkship, what I thought was impossible. Mark 10, 27, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men, it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. I dare say impossible is where God starts. Imagine if I would have applied in August or September and I would have got a clerkship, God would not have gotten the glory. That's the natural process. But here I am in March, late March, and not only did I get a clerkship, I got the exact clerkship that I was wanting. It's not up to us. See, it's God's job to do. It's our job to have faith that he will. A lot of times you hear that the opposite of faith is fear. But that's not really true. See, fear is faith. It's just faith in the wrong thing. Fear is faith in the enemy's plan. The true opposite of fear is love. The Bible tells us perfect love casts out all fear. When you understand how much God loves you, you'll have no fear of him fulfilling his plans in your life. When you truly grasp and understand who he is and his love. He killed his only son, put him on the cross to be battered and bruised for us. We're undeserving, but he's still a good father and he gives us good things. When you understand God's love, there will be no fear in his plans. You're in here and God told you to start that business, but you're stressing and you're worrying about how you're going to make ends meet. Listen to me. God loves you. He loves you so much. He will work it out. Just give him control. You have those kids and you're wondering, how am I going to raise them? They stressing me out. Trust me, I know. But God loves you and more importantly, he loves them. Give them over to God. Give him control, and he will work it out. See, Mary knew this. And when Mary responded, she told the angel, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said 
about me come true. It's not up to us. It's up to God. Our job is just to have the faith. The second thing is this. God has better than good. God has better than good. See, Mary had a good plan. She was getting married. She was planning her wedding, probably planning her bachelorette. Like, she had a good plan. There was nothing wrong with her plan. I had a good plan. Texas was a good plan. (laughs) But is it a God plan? Just because it's good doesn't mean it's God. See, after that clerkship, I took the first job that I got. Um, Partly because the clerkship paid little to nothing, and I was broke. I needed a job. But I didn't consult God. I took the first job that offered me an interview and hired me. I was like, great. And I was miserable. I mean, miserable. And to be honest, I wasn't really good at it. I wasn't. (laughs) I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I would have never told them that. But I wasn't really good at it. Every single review, they'd be like, how's it going? I'm like, great. I love it here. (laughs) But I was miserable. And a lot of times what we do is we hold on to our good because we don't see God's better. See, I was holding on to that job because I was like, I need to pay my bills. I need, I, need, I need to make it. And a lot of times we hold on to that man or that woman because I'm getting older and I need to get married and have kids. Or we hold on to that career even though God told you to go start that business, but you're holding on to that career because you're like, I need consistent salaries. I have a family to take care of. We're holding on to our good because we don't see God's better. Travi, come up here. You guys say hi to Travi. So this is Travi, and Travi loves God. Travi um, serves at the church. And she believes that she has given God control of her life. So Travi has a plan for her life, and her plan is good. Travi plans on getting married. She's following her career path. She plans to make lots of money so she can give back to the church. Because you know that's sometimes what we do. God, I want to go make a lot of money so I can bless your house and my closet. But Travi had a plan, and her plan was good. Let me get Travi's good. This is Travi's good, and it's so cute. Got cute little ears. But what this represents is our plans for our lives. And our plans for our lives is good. They're good plans. They're, they're, you can even say they sometimes fit within the Bible. Like, these are God plans. I want to get married. I want to have kids. He placed those desires in your heart. But how many of you guys know God has better? See, I was holding on to that job, and I heard God. I knew he was telling me, tell me, this isn't it. I got something better. But in my head, I'm like, God, I got bills. But he's like, I have better. I'm like, okay, God, I'm planning a wedding. And I'm going through all of these things, and God is like, oh, my, I I could just sense him getting frustrated with me. I told you guys I have a six-month-old, and he has this little giraffe thing called a Sophie that he is obsessed with. And when he gets hungry, he goes to work gnawing at it. It's a little rubber thing. And I'll have a bottle, and I'm trying to give it to him, but he won't let go of the selfie to get exactly what it is that he wants, something better, something that will actually fulfill him. But he's holding on so tight, and sometimes I get so frustrated that I snatch the selfie out of his hand so I can give him the better. And let me tell you, sometimes we hold on so tightly to our plans that sometimes God snatches it from us. And we say it's the devil, but God, our good father, is like, I need this out of your hand so I can give you my better. I was holding on so tightly to that job, and then God snatched it. I ain't get fired. They just ain't renew my contract. Just saying. (laughs) But this was in May. God's better didn't come till November. I'm sitting there from May to November watching my friends go on in their career. Some of my friends, we started at that job together and they're still there. 
I'm taking temp jobs. Can I be honest? It was a little embarrassing. I was this person who was loving God, serving God, faithful in his house. And here I am, unemployed. And if I didn't know God and if I didn't trust God, can I be honest? I would have ran right back to good. Because this is safe. This is comfortable. I know this. I can make this happen. But while you're waiting, you have to trust and know that he is a good father. And he has better than good. And if good left, if that man left you, if that woman left you, if that job got taken from you, don't fret. Have faith in the God that you serve. Because when he does bring you his better, can I get God's better? When he does bring you his better, it is bigger, better than anything you could have imagined. (laughs) And here's a really big thing. God's better is so great that sometimes you can't carry it in your own strength. You're going to have to rely on him. You're going to have to depend on him. Imagine if during that time that I was waiting, I went back to good. God has this for me, but I'm holding on to this. Whatever it is that you're holding on to, drop it and surrender it to God because what he has is far above anything that you could have imagined. And while you're waiting, the Bible says, in Jeremiah 29, 11, and I didn't want to use this verse. Y'all know Pastor, this Pastor Stephen's verse, but it's just good Bible. But it says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. So when your hands are empty, God still has good. He has better than good. When your hands, when you feel like, hey, people are, people are progressing and people are moving and I'm just kind of standing still. Psalm 37, 7, and this is good Bible, y'all. It says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Can I give y'all Timmy's version? It says, mind your business and stay in your lane. Don't focus on what the person to the left and to the right is doing. Focus on what you and God are doing. During that season when I was waiting, my friends was moving on, leaving me behind. We're in group text, and they're like, yeah, I was in court today, and I was doing this, and I was doing this, and I was doing that. I could have ran back to good. I could have focused on what everyone around me was doing. But I chose to trust him, and because I trusted him, Travi, you can go have a seat. You want your good? (laughs) But I trusted him, and I trusted in what he was doing. And in November, I got a call, and um, it was was somebody who was helping me look for a job, and they were like, Temi, there's this job that's come up, and I'm going to be honest with you, you don't qualify. You don't have any of the qualifications on your resume. I mean, like, not a one. And there's two other people who fit exactly what they're looking for. But I think you should still apply. Great pep talk, right? I was like, sure. Applied, went on the interview. Didn't think anything of it. And I got the call a couple of days later, um, and it was my new boss. And he was like, hey, you got the job. And in my head, I'm like, huh? How? Like, in the interview, he was like, have you ever done this? I was like, no. (laughs) Okay, well, have you ever done this? No. What about this? No. At one point, I was like, sir, I'm going to be honest with you. I've never done anything that you're about to ask me (laughs) if I've done but I can do it. And I left that interview feeling like I'm not going to get that job. But guess who got the job? Again, what looks impossible with man is not impossible with God. The last thing is this. There's a bigger picture. See, Mary... Mary was going to get pregnant and have this baby, and that was a miracle in and of itself. And there's been a lot of women in the Bible that have had miracle babies. We talked about Sarah, who had a baby at 90 and gave birth to nations. Rebecca gave birth after she was barren, gave birth to Jacob and Esau. 
Even her cousin Elizabeth was carrying John the Baptist, who would pave the way for God. And how many of you guys know their babies were all miracles? But Mary was carrying the miracle of all miracles. Her miracle was different than everybody else's. She was carrying the Savior of you and I. There's always a bigger picture. Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, Temi cannot see. You cannot see. People cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. See, a lot of times we want to see the whole picture. And I'm going to be honest, I do too. Sometimes I'm like, God, can you just download how this whole thing's going to play out? But that's not how God works. God sees the whole thing. The Bible says that he is alpha and omega. He's the beginning and the end, but he's also in the middle. So what you don't understand, he does. The Bible says that his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. So how you expect God to deliver a miracle to you is not how he's going to do it. We're sitting here and you're just like, man, let me, let me, let me, let me be real. I'm sitting in here and I'm like, man, I want my, I want my student loans paid off. And I'm thinking, okay, I need to make more money. I need to do this. What I need to do is trust in God. And you're sitting in here and you're like, I want to start this business and I, I need to do this. And I need to take this small business loan or I need to do this. What you need to do is trust in God. See, Mary trusted in God. And because she did, her life was so much more impactful than anything she could have planned on her own. We're sitting in a room listening about, talking about her story thousands of years later. Because she was obedient to God, we have salvation. There's a bigger picture and it's not going to look the way you want it to look. But God knows everything and he knows what he's doing. All you have to do is trust him and take the next step. To bring this full circle, I went to a college called Texas A&M University. Oh, okay. Come on now, Aggies. We in the building. It's not Turp country. I said it. But I went to Texas A&M University, and while I was there, I met a girl who had a friend in Maryland. And when I moved to Maryland, she connected me with that friend who went to a church, and she invited me to get baptized. And I joined that church and joined a dream team, and I met a girl who had a mom who was a judge two years before I would ever need her. See, at the time, I didn't know what God was doing. I was just taking the next step. Now I'm here, an executive pastor at the fa one of the fastest growing churches in America. I'm helping, see, I'm helping see marriages be restored. I'm helping seeing families be restored. I'm helping seeing people receive freedom. If God would have showed me that plan five years ago, I would have got on that plane and went to Texas. I'd be sitting there right now eating my croissants. Sometimes we want to see the whole thing. Think about your life like a maze, like a corn, corn maze. I think that's what y'all have up here. <laughs> I'm still Texas, y'all. But a corn maze. And when you're in that maze, you can only see your next step. You can only see whether you go left or you go right. But God is in heaven and he's looking down in that maze. He sees the entrance and he sees the exit. And when you submit and surrender control of your life, he directs your way. The Bible says we make plans, but God orders our steps. And here's the really good thing. When you turn left, when God told you to turn right, he can still see the whole maze and get you back on track. God has a plan for your life. And it's a good plan. It's a it's better than good. It's better than anything you're sitting in here thinking about right now. And he has these plans and he will make it happen if you just surrender control. Now, church, you may be sitting here looking at me and saying, I've given God control but have you really? 
What was that last thing God told you to do, but it didn't really sound the way you wanted it to sound? It's not too late. Remember the maze. He can get you right back on track. But I want you guys to know when you give God control of your life, you live a life of purpose. You live a life of fulfillment. You live a life that at the very end, you will hear, well done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you are in our midst. And God, we thank you because we know that you are a good father and you have good plans for our lives. So in this moment, God, we say that we are surrendering control to you. And church, repeat after me. Let's say this prayer together. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And take a second to really make it personal. Maybe you're in here and God is telling you, I have a plan for you, but I'm not in control. You're still driving. Or maybe you're in here and God is saying, that last thing I told you to do, go back to it. But you might be in here and you're thinking, I don't even know who this good God is. And if that's you, it would be my honor and privilege to introduce you to our Savior. And if that is you, I would love to lead you in this prayer. And church, out of encouragement, can we all say this together? Say, dear God, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for giving your life so that I can live mine. In this moment, I surrender control. I give you my life. I say, have your way. In Jesus' name. Church, can we celebrate those who just said the prayer for the first time? The Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice when even one person gives their life to Christ. So church, can we celebrate one more time?